everybody. Thank you for checking out this episode of Raised on the Radio. I am one half of the show. I am Colt Brocato, my good friend Patrick Blair in Zoom land, as usual, fired up and ready to go on a Thursday evening. I've got a, I've got a whiskey sitting here in front of me. You got a PBR in front of you. <laughs> so I have, I, have a, I, have a, I have a story. I'm ready. So I don't know if you remember, you know, but my, my son, he had his first real accident, like, you know, hurt himself bad. He was here alone with me and he was running. It was right after he ate his breakfast. He was all excited. He was all energized because I gave him fucking waffles with sugar-free syrup and fucking turkey sausage. And this kid's just fucking hyped. And he's just doing laps, right? And he tripped face first into the coffee table, busted his lip. I mean, dude, when he, I was in the other room, I was doing dishes. Just hear, do, 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 poof, scream. And I'm like, fuck. I run in there and he turns around and looks at me, dude. He looked like Michael Chandler after he fought Gaethje, like just <laughs> mouth open, blood everywhere. I'm like, so I'm like, you know what? As a reward before his nap, just to get his mind off of the fact that, you know, he's playing with it with his tongue and, you know, he's a kid. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know mm-hmm. not to do that. It's a new thing in his mouth. He's like, oh, this is pretty cool. And oh, fuck, it hurts. So now I'm going to cry again every two <laughs> minutes, every two minutes. So like, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take you to the park. I'm going to take you to the park. We're going to walk. It's like a good mile and a half walk. I'll get some exercise. You'll go to the park. You go to the playground. You'll, you'll have fun. You'll get your mind off this thing. So he gets out. He runs straight for the playground. He's, he's having a good time. He's uh, not being shy with the other kids. He's not playing with them, but he's not intimidated by them. He, he eventually climbs up this little thing and he just sits down. This kid comes up. The whole point of this story is I had a moment that that first time parent moment i'm gonna pause there you have a video i want you to play the video okay and then i'll come back to my story some of the things i've done all right (laughs) last year this is the first time i ever had somebody bully one of my kids i didn't respond well this is what i took my older son to a park he was two and a half that cutest little fucking kid and he walks into the park and we he walks up to a playground set And as he walks up to it, he steps on it. And an older kid, meaning four, he goes, you can't play with that. That's mine. And I go, I'll kick your chest through your back. (laughs) (laughs) So the great Tom Segura. Yeah. So this kid drops down, nearly kicks my son's head off. And then he looks at him and he goes, Oh, he's got a boo-boo. And I go, this kid can't be more than four, maybe five. And I go, yeah, you know, he tripped and fell. And he goes, he's like in my kid's face. And he's like, how did he do that? And he goes, what did he trip over? And I go, might have been his own feet. And then the kid starts laughing. And he goes, ha, 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 I've never done that. Now, that, what you just heard there, it took over my soul and I just got a serious (laughs) face and I go, there's a first time for everything, kid. I looked around. I was like, all right, no adult was paying attention. And I grabbed my son and I walked away and that kid was just looking at me like, what did he just say to me? I'll kick your chest through your back. (laughs) So I had, I had that moment. That was the first time I've had that moment. And this kind of has to do with kids, but I don't know why I have a, it's an important question. I want you to answer it honestly. Okay. Why are farts so funny? Can you break that down a little bit for me? Like, are you, okay. are you, being, are you, are you asking me why is, why, well, are, a farts serious funny question. Other, why are farts funny to other people? Or are you to saying like, in general, farts in general are funny, and to why me, why are they funny? No, in general and to me. So I'm in target with my son last weekend and uh-huh. he's in the car, you know, you put their little legs through and there's just, there's nothing but just fart. Like it's like a fart microphone, those carts. You know, uh-huh. and he uh-huh. is just in target, just fucking burr, 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 <laughs> burr, burr, just fucking <laughs> farting out. And it's loud, dude. It's loud. And like, luckily, the first three times I'm laughing, I'm like, nobody heard that. And then the fourth <laughs> time, this lady was like within earshot and he did it. And I start laughing at him. I'm like, dude. And she looks at me like, Ugh. I'm like, listen, you funky bitch. <laughs> He's not even two. What do you want him to do? Hold it in? What do you want him to do? You want him to die? He's got to let that out. He's got to let it out. 
So here's the question. How was your son reacting to doing that? Was he like just, has just, no idea. Just, just playing with a toy and it's just air coming out. Like he, he has no that. idea it's happening. <laughs> just burnt, burnt, just fucking, but it made me think about how funny farts still are to me. But when I was a kid, dude, if there was a, <laughs> I just remember, cause you know, I had, I went, I went to Catholic school. So I had to go to church pretty much every day, mm-hmm. dude. There would always be every time we're at church, there would always be one fart. <laughs> Dude, I would have to be like, I got to dismiss myself because I'm in church. I'm in the presence of the Lord and I'm never going to stop laughing about that fart. <laughs> There's just always just that, it, 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 you know, you're on wood and it just fucking echoes throughout <laughs> the acoustics of the church. But there was this one time that this kid fell asleep. I was in the fourth grade. I'll never forget it because I remember the teacher, but this kid fell asleep during mass and farted in his sleep, but it wasn't just like, it was just like, like that, you know, and dude, I, I was having a panic attack. I was going to throw up. It was so funny. And I remember as soon as it happens, I immediately like, Oh my God. Oh my God. And my, my teacher, in the fourth grade was a nun and she was that shit insane. And she locked eyes with me as soon as it started happening, like midway through the fart. And I'm like, oh God. And I had to sit there with my hand over my face and just lock, like I'm locked eyes with a crazy nun who will send me to hell if I laugh at this hysterical fart that happened in church. So anyway, I lock eyes with this nun. She eventually looks away from me and I, I nearly pass out from holding my, holding my face and trying to hold my breath, hold the laugh back and, and from the laughter, nearly fall over in church. Fourth grade, just like that, dude, hysterical. When she, it, when she locked eyes with you, was that just because you, she heard you laughing or because you were that kid that she's like, no, no, no. I was just happens, the first person. Like I was just close. Okay. I was in eye shot. And, and, and it wasn't even like I started laughing yet. I heard it and I knew what was happening and I was going to laugh. And then I look and I'm like, oh no. Like, but here's the thing. I would laugh today at that. I would have to leave. I would have to leave. I would have to go outside because I'm never going to stop laughing at that. That's hilarious. Mm-hmm. But the reason that I thought about this it was after that, the very same day that my son farts in Target like 16 times. Did you, have you watched the new Ricky Gervais special on Netflix? I haven't. So he was talking about how he gets negative comments all the time. And I guess somebody's comment to him was he's like, you're about as funny as a fart at a child's funeral. Something like that. And Ricky Gervais was like, how can I be upset about that because that's the funniest thing i've ever heard not only is it a fart in church but at a kid's funeral that whole thing i don't want to butcher his joke but go watch it it's, it's actually really good uh, okay. i don't know why i'm saying actually he's funny then it got me thinking about that time in church dude I, every every time we'd be there there would just be a it's just like someone a fart is just gonna happen like you can be in public with a grandparent or with a parent or something but like there's an age where it's just like you just be walking down wa- the aisle in Walmart and that person's just going to let one rip just and just keep on going like it didn't even happen. I've been doing that since I was 13. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I say it to my wife every time. What, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do about it? <laughs> I could hold it in and I might get sick. So we're just going to let it fly. That's, that seems like your excuse is that, I mean, do you really think that there's something there? There's got to be a science behind it. I haven't verified it. <laughs> I haven't talked to a doctor about it, but it has to be real, right? Sure. If you don't let it out, it's got to go somewhere. It's I kinda, can't I mean, wait to be old and just fucking shit my pants in front of people and just, you know, ah, well, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. You know, you know, what, you know, what's bad though, is that with your son doing it and you laughing and you can't stop laughing. It's hilarious. You, you do realize that it's not going to be too much longer before he's doing it on purpose because he knows he it's funny. I can't wait. He's going to be the funniest kid in the world. <laughs> Have you if heard he... about this yet? Th- about uh keystone light and cores having to pull, pull a bunch of their beer off the shelf. No, you haven't seen this yet. No. 
Oh man. All right. Hang on. Here we go. Oh my God. My, it, look. Oh, it doesn't oh, move. Like rubber. No way. That's right out of a can. That's, that's fake. Legit. No, that's it's fake. not. That's legit. No. It is. No. They, they, they had, of course, had to make a statement about it, about them. Show pulling. me a statement. I've got it. Hang on. Here we go. This is off of yahoo.com. Yeah, kind of trustworthy. Let's see. In recent weeks, food and beverages recalls have affected dozens of products in the U.S. Let's see. Uh, Molson Coors recently became aware of a quality issue on certain 12-ounce can packages of Coors Light and Keystone Light produced solely at the Trenton Brewery. The store wrote in the announcement, while there are no food safety risks associated with the product, they are choosing to withdraw it from the market as to not disappoint consumers. Could you imagine if you drank that? That was so viscous. Why was the beer like, but how does beer even get that way? I don't know. They're not even, from what I've researched, they're not even saying what is causing it. It's just, they're just saying that it's not a hazard to anybody, but they are pulling it off the shelves. It's not a hazard to drink motor oil. That, that's terrible. Yeah, I know. It's weird, right? Well, I don't drink. Who I drinks, don't either. Who drinks? Who, who, no, the, the bigger question, yeah, is Keystone. Who drinks Keystone Light? Who the fuck drinks that? I, I don't know that I've ever had that. I don't think I have, actually. I mean, I've definitely had Coors, but I don't think I've. Isn't Keystone the one that had the bitter beer face commercials? Yes, dude. That's hilarious that you said that because I was trying to find this YouTube video that I just showed you and yeah. it was bringing up the Keystone and I was like, I completely forgot about the beer, bitter beer face commercials. And then I that was wife, like a whole market like, scene where like, we want to get people to drink our beer because the other beer sucks, but it made me want to drink their beer less. And how also, did, how did it do that? And also, have you ever had a beer that wasn't like an IPA or a craft beer that you would say is bitter? I don't know if there's any regular beer out there that i would say oh that's bitter bitter is not the right word shitty yes <laughs> bud light sucks bud light is my I least hate, favorite I I, i'll it. never drink I bud light. It. it sucks it's the worst bud um, light and Michelob ultra are two of my least favorite i would every single time no matter the occasion drink Michelob ultra over bud light i if i had to make the choice I, that's what i would do too but i, I can't stand either one of them Bud light's terrible it's like sweet and it's like I don't know. There's something about it. It's just gross. I hate it. I think what we need to do right now is pause from all the bullshit we're talking about. And we need to show some respect and say happy birthday to Tupac Shakur, who would have been 51 yep. today, which is insane. Fucking insane. Yeah. Insane. But while I'm on the subject of Tupac, who, by the way, is my favorite rapper of all time, and I will not take arguments on this i don't care who you think is he's mine you're not going to convince me otherwise <laughs> i don't care what stats you have i don't care what fucking bars you have what lyrics you have tupac's my favorite he's the best to me there will never be another person who's better than him don't argue with me about it and many people have tried i'm like you're never going to change my mind people have argued eminem they've argued jay-z they've argued nas which is a valid argument so when, Maybe, you, when, you, course, when you when you when you have the argument, are you actually giving reasons why he's or like why yes. he's a be, why he's a better artist than any of those other ones that they're I'm naming? So or, glad you asked. Yes. Or are you just saying yes. you just saying you're not going to change my mind? He's my favorite. No, no. I well, I mean, I have in my opinion what I believe to be the reasons that he is the best. Yes. First of all, his voice. Second of all, his lyrics. Third of all, his impact in such a short amount of time. Fourth of all. He was in the time, in the time that he came out before and forget about gangsta thug life, Tupac. We're talking about early era Tupac. He was really the first mainstream rapper of his kind to really talk about societal and like societal issues and, and things that a lot of people didn't talk about. Like he was sort of like a patriot for the underclass and now, eventually, he got away from that because he went to jail and he got out of jail and he signed to a fucking gangster rap label and the rest is history. But before that, I'm talking Brenda's got a baby, Tupac, like deep fucking thinker, Tupac, the dude that just came out of Digital Underground, the dude that was like trying to like also the son of a Black Panther, 
uh, was trying to get his message across and was trying to make a difference with the words that he spoke. Nobody did that at that time, or nobody sounded like that at that time, especially if that fit into that whole, you know, West Coast sort of like, uh, I don't know. And I'm and like, when I say this, I'm talking about the beats, like funkadelic type beats. Nobody, everybody was talking about gangster rap. Everybody was talking about what they had. Everybody was talking about money, whatever. When he started or when he was on the come up, he wasn't like that. And that's really the Tupac that drew me in. And I'll be honest with you. I love the Thug Life Tupac too. I mean, Tupac is like top five artists for me all time. Like he is a major influence on me, not only as a musician or artist, but just as a person. And I know a lot of people are like, well, he shot two undergrover cops and he fucking do sexual stuff. Yeah, okay, fine, fine. None of which have been proven. So, uh, you know, and this is really coming from a time where you had to be, you're innocent until proven guilty. Not now where you're guilty until proven innocent. But yeah, as an artist, dude, yeah. No, hands down. There's not even. So what about what about him was influential for you? Like in, in your music? Well, it, it, especially coming from a guy who lyrics don't matter. And, but you're talking about a guy who was talking about societal issues. Sure. And things like that. So, of course, lyrics mattered with, with what he was talking about. So what was influential to you about him in your music career? Well, the, but you got to understand what the lyrics, those lyrics, I heard those lyrics when I was 10 years old, 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old, you know, they had a huge impact on me. And then once I got older, I mean, he died. I remember where I was when I found out he died. I was a freshman in high school. Actually, it was the summer before I became a freshman. So I didn't get to experience him as a teenager necessarily, or as a young adult. I had all the music from when I was a child. So for me, it was just looking back and reflecting on what he was saying and how I took it in as a kid and how I took it in as a kid living where I live and having the friends I had and just the impressions that I had on my life. He just, he just made a huge dent, you know, but the same way that, you know, Kurt Cobain did and, you know, Eddie Vedder did and fucking Outkast did, you know, I mean, it's all the same to me. I don't, I don't like, to me, you're an artist, you're an artist. It doesn't matter what genre you come from. I just so happen not to be influenced by people from specific genres, mainly country. But everything else, it's like, I don't <laughs> care about genre. It's just, what are, you, what are you saying? What are you doing? You just have to catch me. And he just did, dude. He was, he was a rock star to me. He really was. Like, I know, like, I know, like, we've talked about and joked about and people have talked about, like, Machine Gun Kelly is really like bought into the whole, like I'm a rock star thing now with the music and his whole like image and dude, the fucking shirt off with the pants sagging with the fucking jewelry on and the tattoo showing Tupac was doing that in 1990 fucking two. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. But not Tupac. Machine Gun Kelly doesn't have a fucking, a fucking table to sit on when it comes to that dude. Do you, do you know the, um, the story about MGK, like him growing up and stuff. You sent me this video earlier about that they're looking at, I guess, making a documentary about MGK. No, it's made. It's coming out soon. Oh, it's made already? It is. Oh, okay. yeah. So, it's coming out it, on Hulu. Anyways, for, for one, something I have no no reason to see because I have no, I don't have a desire to watch it. But, you know, just from like the the trailer that you sent me, it shows like him oh, I got a gun pulled on me here when I was this age. And uh, my first music video was in front of that uh, ADM store or something like that. And it, it just, I'm wondering if you know what his upbringing was like and is the documentary going to make it seem worse than it actually was or no? Uh, no, and I'll tell you why. But let me finish my thoughts on Tupac. Okay, I good. swear I'll tell you why. So my main thing about Tupac is you know what? We'll come back to Tupac because I have a whole lot more to say and it's going to take up time. <laughs> Let me answer your question. No, I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're going to glitz and glam it up because his, he grew up in the, he came up in the YouTube era. So you've seen, everyone has seen if you, if you, if you paid attention or if you want to go research, you, you can know where he came from. You don't, there's no guessing about it. You can watch videos of, the first time he was on uh, Sucker Free Sundays on MTV, you know, which is a hip hop, like if you're a hip hop artist, if that happened to you, that's fucking insane. 
and it was him fucking Ryman uh, in Cleveland. Like, I don't remember exactly where he was. I, I want to say he was in front of the lake downtown somewhere, but you know, do, he was spitting a freestyle or whatever. And uh, it was on MTV. They used to have a thing where they give a guy, like a guy like two minutes and they would just do a freestyle. And I remember there's, there was a video that they shot of that, like a live reaction video. So you could see where he comes from. Like, there's no, I don't think they're going to, they're not going to make it. He has no reason to lie about that at this point, because it's, it's all been out there the, you know, if he did lie about it, people would be like, Hey bro, no. And I'm one of those, I'm one of those people. I mean, I met the dude in 2011 in Cleveland at the studio where he recorded a lot of his stuff at before he got signed to bad boy. I met his whole crew. I met, you know, like I know, but to be fair, I was a fan of him before I met him. We actually right. knew who he was. We were aware of the sucker free Sunday freestyle. We were aware of the, the YouTube videos he had put out when he fucking, he, uh, he did a verse over, or he did a couple of verses over that fucking Fort minor song that, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. Um, so we, we knew who he was and we just, we knew that we were going to a studio where he recorded. We, under no circumstances thought we would meet him and he just fucking showed up one day and i'm saying we like me and one of the other guys who wasn't even in the band by the way he just came along was like a, a beer buddy but like we you know we knew who he was and we were fans and so oh no man i don't think they're gonna lie no there's no reason to okay no and, see, and you I... can he's made he's made his own i'm using air quotes here documentaries for specific things coming up through his career in Cleveland, where he started, where he came from, you know, you can see all this already. You could have seen all this already. So I would say for those of you who are like a new fan and you go, oh, is this really what his life was like? Go fucking YouTube, Machine Gun Kelly, go back to the early days. And yeah, you'll find out a lot. He, he, I, don't, I don't know that he ever it completely exposed everything about himself, but he didn't hide a lot. His daughter has always been a big part of his career. He has a mixed daughter. Uh, who, by the way, I'm sure catching a ton of shit from some kids at school right now, because I think she's in high school now about your dad's a fucking poser, your dad, this, can you imagine being the kid of that guy? And now you're in fucking middle school, high school. Imagine the shit people are saying to you, you know? Yeah. I mean, maybe, or maybe you're the coolest kid in school because your dad is MGK. I doubt it. I seriously doubt it. I, I, I hope you're right. Yeah, I really do. I hope you're right, but I doubt it. I'm going to watch that documentary. I'm curious. I think it's funny that they made it now because of the whole, my rock music has blown up, but dude, again, good for him. My, see, my thought was, and you know, you said 2011, how long do you think he had been at it or, or be, I guess been a name before then? Like what, if you had to get, say a year, before I met him? Yeah. Cause you said 2011 is when you met him. So, well, so like I, he was already in talks with bad boy. Then he was probably 19 years old. I don't know. A couple of years. Okay. A couple of years. Yeah. I mean, he, he, had... like, I guess, I guess, I guess for some reason, maybe it's just because he became a lot more of a name, a lot more recently than that. But my, my original thought was, has MGK really been around long enough to have a documentary made about him? But now, but now that I know yeah, say, that it's, I mean, it's a lot longer than that, I mean, I guess yeah, it I mean, doesn't, I guess time in the, you know, in a genre or time in the, in the, in the industry doesn't really matter, I guess, when it comes to how long have you been in it before you actually make a documentary that people are going to want to see? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter. It just, that was the first thing, the first thought that clicked in my head. Yeah. I mean, I would say that if Billie Eilish can have one, he can have one. Let's be real fucking honest right now. Yeah, true. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's going to it's going to glorify all of the shit he's done and good for him. Good for I mean, dude. I mean, you can't hate on the fucking the shine. You can't hate on the, the success, you know? Yeah. I mean, you could try. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. I mean, dude, good for him. I don't know. I mean, when I saw it, I was like, oh, wow. Documentary. Really? But dude, Juice World has a documentary. He's dead. Granted. Uh, you know, XXX Tentacion has a documentary, and I still need to watch that. By the way, you know, both dead, but they were artists. I mean, they weren't even in the in the game for a couple of years. That's it. So, I don't know. Yeah, MGK, I could see it. 
but dude, you gotta, well, think about it this way. Like you're in one genre, you're successful in it. You, you get into a beef with the biggest rapper, arguably of his generation, right? Everybody thinks your career is over. You get into it or you forced one? Because he, he didn't strike first, man. Nah. Eminem did it first. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. Eminem really did fucking, it was first. Yeah. You know, but you do that. People are like, oh, your career is over. You got murdered by Eminem, which really he didn't, by the way. But, and then you transform your career, you know, and it's like, well, people were like talking about how the rock thing was like an overnight success thing. And I'm like, have you not listened to any of his fucking records? Like he had rock songs on previous records that did really well. So it's not like he, this is new. So I mean, back to Tupac. Yep. Yeah. Happy birthday. He's the greatest ever. And I want to talk about something that is preposterous. Did you view the Rolling Stones top 200 rap albums of all time? So when you sent me that, I was thinking that 200 is a freaking lot. And it no, is. it is. No, I did not. Okay. Let me just say this. In no way on any universe, in any time, should Cardi B have a better record than Tupac. But not only Tupac, DMX and Nas. Her record is higher on the list. Top 200 hip hop albums of all time is higher on the list than any record that Tupac put out, any record that Nas put out, or any record that DMX put out. Get the fuck out of here. So you're, I'm kind of more interested. going to convince me of that. I'm kind of more interested in the topic of, so when you sent me this, uh, you said that exact same thing to me. And I said, well, it is a Rolling Stone art article. And you said that you're tired of that excuse. So my, th- I, I, I want to know what you mean by that. How, what you're what tired I mean by that is excuse. stop putting out lists. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, I had mean, that yeah. answer ready to go because I knew you were going <laughs> to. Oh, it was cocked and loaded ready. Yeah, I get it. I mean, but why? So you're, you're just telling Rolling Stone to stop putting out lists or you're telling, you're saying yeah. people period. No, Rolling Stone, because all they do is try to please people. That list is, is a people pleaser. Right. That's and, why... that's, and, and that's my point is Rolling Stone still tries to appeal to the new, the younger audience, right? The new, the newer audience. And that's not why only that may be above. It's a very, forgive me for saying this. It's a very female driven list. I love Missy Elliott. I do. I really do. But she does not, does not have a better record than Tupac, Nas, or DMX. And she does on this list. I love Lauren Hill. Now, her record's number 10 on the list. And I think all things considered, the miseducation of Lauren Hill should be high on any list of any record ever put out for any genre ever. Okay. Okay. Now, my only concern is this. You put it at number 10. You had Cardi B at number 20. And you know what? Let me pull up the list. Just so I'm not speaking out of turn here. Let me give you the, you want me to give you the top five real quick to give you some context? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me give you, <laughs> excuse me, in the top 20, how many females we have. So look him, hardcore is number 19. Okay. I'll give you that. Cardi B. Invasion of Privacy from 2018 is number 16. So you mean to tell me that that is the 16th best record in hip hop history? That's it. it, it. Number 15, Eric B and Rakim, paid in full, should be higher on the list. Do we do we know what do, do we know as far as the article goes? Do we know how like what 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 is making them rank them this way? Who fucking knows, dude? I mean, because this isn't based off of like streams and no, no, no. This is just who like has, right? you know. Well, they, they, well, they talk about relevance. They talk about all these things, and I'm glad you asked that because there's a record that I want to talk about that I think is so insanely two records that are too insanely low on the list. Let me give you the top. I said top five. I'm sorry. I was giving you. Hold on. All right, it's so top five. Here we go. Number five, Kendrick Lamar to Pimp a Butterfly. All right, fine. I, again, we're, we're catering to the new school here with that. Is it in my top five? Not even close. 
Is it in a lot of people's top five? A lot of people's top five? I really don't think so, unless they're under the age of 30. Number four. So here they try to give us one back. Public enemy, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Okay, fine. I'm, I have nothing to say about that. Number three, Jay-Z, the blueprint, of course, should be in most people's top five. It's not mine, but it should be. Number two, Outcast, Stankonia. Now, this is a great record, and I really do like it, but it is the third best Outcast record ever. And the other two that I think are ahead of it are didn't even crack the top 100, I don't think. So mm -hmm. that's my biggest problem with that. This is their most successful record, broke them, made them mainstream pop artists, but, but in no way is it their best record, in my opinion. When we're talking about hip-hop, number one, the Notorious B.I.G. Ready to Die. No, I don't have any problem with that. A lot of people would put that there. I'm not going not gonna to argue against it. Now, what I said was Cardi B is number 19. Again, ahead of Tupac, ahead of Nas, and ahead of DMX. And we could name many other people that she shouldn't be ahead of that she is. But it's insane. It's insane. So well, I'm glad you I... asked about, like, how did they create this list? Right. So one of the records that I want to talk about, two of the records, but the first one would be Bone Thugs and Harmony is one of my favorite groups of all time. East, 1990, East 1999 Internal by them is one of my favorite records of all time. On this list, it was, which by the way, my number one record of all time would be Tupac, Me Against the World. It's number 134. Just fucking insane. <laughs> insane. Insane. So stupid. 127. So here's what they write. Cleveland group, Bone Thugs and Harmony had rap's geographic affinities to contend with when they released their seminal record, East 1999 Eternal. The irony, of course, is that Bone Thugs' concerns were straight from the heartland. There are few regions as economically ravaged as the Cleveland area, and on songs like Mo Murda and Mr. Bill Collector, economic and social anxieties arrive with a melodic yet sorrowful sort of groove. It pays to look beyond the coasts. So you say that, and you're like, oh, they're from a special part of the country, like the Midwest. This must have been a really impactful record, yet... We're not even going to crack the top 100 with it. So hang on. Now, is, there a, is there a description on all on their reasoning for every album? Yeah. You want to hear Cardi B's? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I love it. Two white guys talking about hip hop. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. I grew up in hip hop. I'll talk about it all day. All right. Does T.I. have an album? What did I say? Yes, but it's way back there. And again, I would have put it so much higher than it is. I'll find it. Cardi B built a reputation as love and hip hop's most beloved, regular, degular, smegular girl from the Bronx. By the way, love and hip hop is a reality show. But when right. it came time to release her debut album, Invasion of Privacy, she threw herself into the music with the menace rammed into someone's throat. While it was the bellicose spirit of the Grammy nominated, so many $10 words that don't matter. Spirit of the Grammy nominated lead single, Bodak Yellow. That set Cardi on course for a historic making career. The greatest achievement of the LP is how it coalesces into a full, unflinching portrait with songs like Best Life and the Mega Mash, I Like It, filling in the details of her rise from strip clubs to reality show fame to hip hop royalty. So they didn't really say much there. They just used a lot of little neat words to describe an album that isn't that good. Hmm. Hip, -hop, hip hop royalty, did they really call her that? Wow. Hmm. Yep. I'm just, it, it's so batshit insane to me. I mean, she, she, her record is higher than UGK riding dirty. Like that record, if that record doesn't come out, we never have the no limit soldiers. We never have the fucking cash money millionaires. Like get the fuck out of here. Like, what are we talking about? Importance, like influence, like, come on. So when I first looked at this list, I missed the fact that Kid Cudi, Man on the Moon, was on it. So, Oh, really? I missed it. I, cool. And I was talking to one of my buddies, like my friend. Shout out to Will from the Den 314 podcast. I was talking mm -hmm. to him about this. I go, how the fuck are you going to have a fucking top 200 hip-hop albums list and not have Kid Cudi, but have Travis Scott and have Juice World? 
because without Kid Cudi, those two artists don't have the records that they have. But then right. I went back and I was like, oh shit, it's number 90. I'll take it. And it should be higher, in my opinion. So wait, the 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 one that Kid Cudi just put out was a second version of that, right? Third that wasn't version. the first man. The third? Okay. Third version. But the one, but it's the first one is what's Man on the Moon. On the list. Okay. Yep. Yep. It is it is properly called Man of the Moon, the end of the day. But 2009. There's Man on the Moon 2, and then he just put out three, you know, a year and a half ago, whatever it was, a year ago. When, um, when, the, when the third one came out, I remember you had told me about it, and I started listening to it, and I really liked it. But I was trying to remember what you had told me about it. I guess, be, I guess you had seen a lot of people hating on it or hating on him or something, but you were saying that, I guess, um, he was getting an ungodly amount of numbers on his own or something. What, what were you telling me about that? Do you remember? Oh yeah, no people. So there are a lot of people. So like there were people saying like, he's done, like he's irrelevant now. And like he sold, you know, 216,000 records in his first week or something when that dropped something, you know, he has a really good following. And, and to be honest with you, so does MGK. Like they have a loyal fan base. So when they put something out, they're going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. But I just heard a lot of people saying like, yeah, oh, he's irrelevant and he's, you know, whatever. And I'm like, man, first of all, he's not irrelevant because a, he's still selling these people look for. And, and also he, he puts out a record every fucking four years, whatever, yeah. you know, he's not like every other artist that like, Oh, it's been a year. Let me put out a record. No, there's, and his fans want him to put out more records. He just doesn't, but like, you know, he's inspired artists and Travis Scott, you know, that are so relevant today. It's like, well, you can't say he's done without him. Travis Scott doesn't have Astral World, for instance, right? Not the right. festival, the record. Yeah. Let's be very clear. The list sucks. I'm not saying yeah, these no, females shouldn't suck. be on the list, but come on. Cardi B, like Meg Thee Stallion was like number 130 or something like really she is the 130th best hip hop record of all time. Right. And that, that's, what's crazy to me is that it's as of all time. And even if you're talking about 200, I don't even want to know what most of that list is just based uh, off of what you've told me. I mean, well, for someone who listens to hip hop, it's the beginning of the list where you're like, Oh fuck. Yeah. You know, but then you're like, Oh, and this is when you start getting pissed off. You're like, Oh, well that should be way higher. Let me see who's higher. And then you're like, oh, fuck, Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion and fucking Nicki Minaj. And... Did Drake have anything on there? Oh, yeah, he's like number 11. Really? Yeah. yeah. So I, you, um, you sent me, what was that? Hang on, I got it. You sent me like two weeks ago. Uh, what was it? Let's see, that Drake set a record for 155 million streams in the first day of his record releasing. So I don't know, have we ever really talked about Drake? Like, are you a big fan of Drake? No. No. Aubrey. Okay. So, no, I don't like Aubrey. What? Aubrey? His name, his name is Aubrey. Is it really? Yeah. Huh, I had no idea. Yeah. Well, I, that makes sense then, because I, I, I didn't know how to take it, because I asked you, did you actually listen to that record? And you text me back and said, excuse me. And I don't know. I didn't know if that meant, of course I did, or if that meant absolutely not. No. Okay. Yeah. I don't get Drake. I never have, never will. Not into it. There are plenty of new school cats that have come up way after Drake that I really love. I don't get, I don't get Drake. I don't get the obsession. I don't get the, one of the greatest MCs of all time talk. I have no idea. Just not. I think it has anything to do with who, who he connects himself with too on like why, like why his following is so big. I mean, he was a fucking Disney star or whatever. <laughs> Wasn't he? I don't know. No, no. He was on uh, He was on that fucking teen show, Degrassi. Oh, was he really? I yeah. had no idea. Yeah. Aubrey. His name's Aubrey. Plus, he's Canadian. You're going to can't. Canada's going to cancel us, man. Oh, man. What a bummer. But I will say this. A huge part of who he is as an artist has to do with where he comes from because he's from Toronto and, you know, Toronto has a really rich like Caribbean culture and like, it's a very diverse city. 
So I think a lot of his influences come from that. So I can understand why he makes music that connects with people. It just doesn't with me. You know, I just, it's not for me. I, I don't like, I, he just never, it's never been for me. I've tried multiple times and I'll continue to try. When he puts out something new, I listen to a little bit and I'm like, yeah, I just don't, uh, I don't know. I'm a hater, sure. But forgive me if I'm sounding dumb here, but is there a lot of hip hop that comes out of Canada? There's a lot, yeah. There is? Yeah. Like bigger names that I would know? How about snow? I've definitely heard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would never have guessed that it came out of Canada. Canada. Yeah. I would have thought like Jamaica or something. <laughs> we might, might need to leave on that but you and i've never know. known what the words were no one does no one, he doesn't know what the words are <laughs> so what about don Vito? i don't remember how we got on that topic originally you sent me a video i seen a guy in there and i was like yeah, hey i that, don't remember that guy that. looks like he could be don Vito's son and you're like did you did i ever tell you the don Vito story and i was instantly like of course there's a freaking don Vito story let me go piss and I'll tell you the story. But I had no idea what it is. Yeah. So there is a Don Vito story. I don't know. 2006, 2007, maybe it, maybe it was 2005. I don't know. But uh, was this, it, was it this at the height of Viva La Bam? No, no, I don't think so. I think it was like maybe at the start of it, to be honest okay. with you, because I remember after this happened, Don Vito and Ryan Dunn did a tour together. Okay. Doing what? Just going to places and being Don Vito and Ryan Dunn. <laughs> being famous guys from MTV. So we get a call from a promoter and he's like, yeah, I'm putting the show together. I want to do a show. I want to make it, you know, a couple of bands and I want Don Vito to host it. And we're like, yeah, we're in. Okay, enough said. So we booked the show. It was at the, the Creepy Crawl. Sold out show. Packed. I mean, sold out. And in fact, I want to say it sold out before the actual day of. Like, I think like people, like advanced tickets even sold. So now, now question. Yep, yep, yep. Did this sell out because of the bands that were playing or did this sell Absolutely out? Absolutely 100% Don... no. <laughs> because Don Vito was there. Because all of these bands had played together before at the same <laughs> venue and they didn't sell it out. <laughs> Let's just be very clear. Night of, we, we show up. So I was having relations with a girl who was best friends with, with the girl who was the girlfriend of the promoter. Okay? Okay. So she and the girl show up early. And when I get there, no, we're a band. We have gear to load in. Like, they're already there. And they're already shit-faced. They're like, yeah, we've been drinking with Don Vito and his entourage for like the last two hours. And like, immediately, I'm like in a bad mood because of that. I'm like, fuck me. Like, I, I, I want to party, but I still have to play a show. I eventually got over that because I got hammered. But like, <laughs> um, she's like, do you want to come back and meet Don? I'm like, oh, you're on a, you're on a first name basis with him now? That's cool. I'm like, yeah, I'd love to meet him. What's she gonna actually, do? Call him Mr. Vito? <laughs> I don't know. It was just weird. It was just awkward. So, um, I go back. She's you know like pulling me by the hand, and I meet his tour manager, his bodyguard, who, by the way, when she was like, "Yeah, this is his tour manager." I don't know the guy's name. We'll just call him Vince. I was like, "Hey, man, nice to meet you. I'm you know Patrick. I'm playing tonight." He's like, "Oh, cool. Nice to meet you." And this is his bodyguard. We'll call him bro hey bro nice to meet you i was expecting the bodyguard to be a dick but he was like the nicest guy of everybody he was the coolest dude by the way <laughs> not a bodyguard come to find out not a bodyguard just introduced himself that way to the girls i'll get back to that in a second so he was just a guy and i remember being like that guy's not that big to be a bodyguard like he's my size but anyway <laughs> nice guy though to me anyway and then i meet don vito and he's oh hey man you're you know you're with am i gonna say her name and i'm like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah we're friends whatever 
He goes, very nice meeting you. Shaking my hand. He's like looking me in the eyes when he's talking to me. And he's like, very, a very nice guy. Right. And, and that, that was my interaction with him. And then he came on stage. He introduced us. We come on stage. He high fives me. He leaves the stage. He goes back to the green room the backstage area of creepy crawl which is just a shitty room with shit on the floor it's drinking again and so the night's over the show goes and the show goes well and like i said it was sold out and he goes on stage after in between us and the headlining band yeah we were the co-headliner Eric do you remember there. who played that who all played that night the only other band i remember is westcott uh okay. and that was matt amalone's band right yep i don't remember who else played Okay. I could find out. I could definitely find out, but I don't remember who else played. But, um, and I, I want to say that Westcott was the headliner. I want to say that. So, um, in between us and Westcott, he goes up on stage, he does like, I don't know, 10 shots in a row of like hot damn or some bullshit liquor. He's just getting shit faced. And of course, the girl who I'm supposed to have sex with later is partying with him. Oh my God, I'm just so turned off by all of this. I'm like, this is just gross. She was a nice girl. She was just, she was having a good time. You know, she's not, she wasn't like, it was a lifestyle that was, you know, it wasn't her thing. So she was having a good time. She was new to the lifestyle. How about that? Okay. So like, uh, the night's over, the show's over. And Don Vito and his crew want to go out. Well, you're in St. Louis. It's 1 a.m. Where do you go? Where would you go? It's 1 a.m. in St. Louis. Where are you going? I'm assuming you're going to the strip club. Yep. You're going to Sage. Yep. So he hires my drummer of the band I'm in to be his bodyguard, to be his security. Gave him X amount of dollars for the night to be his security. And oh, by the way, it was a tasty amount of money. Okay? Okay. So my drummer goes, well, of course. The drummer of the band I was in was a, oh, he's a big guy. He's a big muscular guy. So he goes, of course, I'll do it. Let's do it. They go to a strip club. They're at Hustler, which is not Saw Jay. They've, 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 progressed from Sajay to Hustler and Vito gets a little handsy with one of the strippers and then he does the whole I'm going to put you in a chokehold thing that he used to do on Viva La Bam and all the shows and the stripper doesn't really think it's funny and all hell breaks loose here's what I know those strippers made a lot of money that night not to call the police <laughs> That's what I know. I don't know how much I might, but. So do you think, you think it was because he was so drunk or do you think it's because he thought I'm Don Vito? Uh, he was hammered. Okay. He was hammered. He didn't know what he was doing. I'm well, just wondering if a guy like Don he, Vito ever he has he the doing. ego of like, no, I'm it wasn't Don that. Vito, like so many people would know, like people know who I am. No, no, no. It wasn't that. It wasn't like a do you know who I am thing. It was like I'm I've been drinking all day. It's okay. 4 a.m. Okay. I don't like he was blackout drunk. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't there, so, but so from what here's I was my, told. Here's another question. Who says I want to put on a rock and roll show and I want Don Vito? I can't tell you. <laughs> to be the host of it. And how does that even happen? Like, how do you get Don? Like, was he specifically in St. Louis just to host that? Or yeah. was he already in St. Louis for a different no. reason? No, no. He was booked. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Let's just say this. I mean, I guess it worked. We, I mean, you, you sold it out. Well, look, let's just say this. This promoter is on a lot of bands' shit lists. But I learned a valuable lesson that night about promoting. And about how profitable being a middleman could be. And for a while after that, after that band was finished and I wasn't on the road and I was just needing something to do, I was booking shows in another venue as the promoter. And I was making a really good chunk of, uh, chunk of change to do so. Really? Yeah. 
And I learned from that guy who a lot of people think is a scumbag. Is there a, I mean, is there a lot of work that has to be done with that? Do you have a computer? Can you, you know, back then MySpace was becoming a thing. Can you promote? Can you post? Can you go flyer? You know, I mean, I booked at a place called Two Cents Plain, which was downtown. Man, I miss, I, I miss that venue a lot. I had a lot of really fond memories there. From booking shows and playing a couple of shows there, like the first show I ever played as a bass player was there. And But, I mean, I took it seriously. Like, I wasn't trying to fuck over the bands. I said, you get this amount of ticket. Sell tickets. And a lot of bands did. You know, here's a funny story. So, well, but Before you tell me, I just, I'm just curious. So... How did it exactly work? Like, were you reaching out to like bands? Yeah, I would reach out to the bands, be like, I, I have a show, I have a show date right. okay. this day at this venue. You want to play? Gotcha. I okay. have this band booked. I have this band booked. And if they were the first band I booked, I'd be like, I'll give you this amount per ticket. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. That's Just pretty all cool. fucking it's sales. That's what it is, you know. But a funny story: the first show I ever booked at this place, which by the way was a sellout. So it was probably like 100 and I think the cap in this place was like 150, maybe. So like to, for me to compare that, like the Firebird, how, what was the cap on Firebird? Uh, 300 maybe. So it was half the size of Firebird? It was a shotgun style bar like Creepy Crawl was. So it wasn't like okay. this. It was like this. Okay. So you walk into the door, the stage is directly to your right and it's raised. And then you just have a shotgun style bar and room to fill. Okay. Right. Gotcha. It might've been more than 150, but I, you know, I do, it's been so long. So the very first show that I booked there, I booked a band called Adelaide. Very good band for the time. And they were the headliner. They sold all of their tickets, kids. They were in, at the time they were in high school, I think, or just out of high school, brought a shit ton of friends to that place. I, of course, brought all the drinking people because I think all the bands I booked were not of drinking age. But so I wanted to get the bartenders paid, fill the place. And so fast forward to the last time I'm out in L.A. recording for Monsters, a sound engineer comes to work with the producer I'm working with. And it's the fucking drummer of Adelaide. He had been living in L.A. for the last fucking seven years working as a sound engineer. That's pretty cool. Crazy crazy yeah. and he the first thing he says to me when he walks in the room he doesn't recognize me and i don't recognize him for sure but he walks in the room he's like yeah st louis dude like what are you thinking about moving out here and i'm like well let's slow down like i don't think so just recording and he goes oh yeah i uh i grew up in brentwood and i was in the band adelaide and i'm like what he goes yeah i was i was the drummer and i was like dude and i just start piecing together the timeline. He's like, oh my God, now I remember you. Pretty crazy. Hmm. Pretty crazy. So yeah, Don Vito choked a bitch. <laughs> Let's get out and of here. Pay, and paid a lot of money. Apparently. I don't you know. get away with it. I wasn't there. Let's go back and get some action. Live it up and get damaged. Yes, we want this action.